Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us so early uh, in the morning. Uh, I am thrilled to uh, be having this panel today moderating a topic that I think is close, near, and dear to every founder, whether you're venture-backed, whether you're early on in your stage of uh, founding your new project, which is on fund uh, investment and exchange listing. And I think I was perhaps asked to moderate the panel because Republic crosses between fund investment and exchange listing. We are a token sale and token distribution platform. We also have an advisory arm that helps projects look at token economics, uh, fundraising and investing, and we're the first portfolio company of Binance. So without further ado, if I may ask uh, the panelists, uh, Seattle Sun from Huabi, Andrew Bromberg from CoinList, and Rita Chang from KuCoin, to do a quick introduction about yourself and particularly your firm, and why don't we start with you, Ciara? Okay. Um, my name is Ciara Sun, um, Financial Analysis MBA, and uh, formerly worked at Boston Consulting Group doing strategy management consulting, um, and I'm now the Chief of Staff at Hobby Group, um, leading the listing efforts and uh, international expansion strategies. So <clears throat> at Hobby Group, um, we are a very um, complex um, group of uh, entities. Um, it's the mother company for a lot of different entities underneath it. Um, so the most famous one would be uh, Hobi Global Exchange. And besides that, we have uh, a lot of other entities um, in the ecosystem, such as uh, Hobi Labs, that's an incubator, Hobi Capital, that's an um, investment fund. And uh, we also have um, local stations, such as uh, Hobi US here. They're, they're headquartered in San Francisco, um, fully compliant in the States. And and uh, we already got um, 30 um, money transmission license in the process of applying for the trust license. And we have um, uh, Hobi Japan and Hobi Korea. Those uh, are 100% owned by um, Hobi Group as well. And then we have joint ventures with local partners. Um, they're underneath Hobi Cloud, um, which would include um, Hobi Mideast, Hobi Indonesia, Hobi Thailand, Hobi Malaysia, and uh, Hobi Turkey. So. Um, and um, we have like around 1,300 employees worldwide. So we are um, really trying to um, put in a lot of efforts for um, building up the ecosystem for blockchain industry. Hey everyone, my name is Andy Bromberg. I'm the president and co-founder of CoinList. Uh, for the past couple of years, CoinList has been the premier platform for token sales. So we've ran a lot of the biggest token sales, most successful token sales in the industry. Filecoin, Blockstack, Props Origin, Algorand, Nervos, uh, and many others. We also run hackathons, online hackathons for projects to help them build developer communities. And then recently, uh, this week, we announced that we're launching Coinless Trade, our exchange. Uh, and that's coming out, rolling out over the next couple of weeks, uh, a brand new cryptocurrency exchange really focused on supporting the projects that we've run primary sales for and enabling secondary liquidity for them and allowing uh, our users to trade on the Coinlist exchange. We also announced a fundraise this week led by uh, Polychain Capital with Jack Dorsey investing as well. Um, so we're excited to move from this primary sale business that we've been doing for the past couple of years, working with the top issuers on running their, their token sales, now into the secondary trading business with Coinlist Trade. I'm Rita from KuCoin, and I work as managing director and oversight the daily listing and operation, and now we start a new research team. And for KuCoin, KuCoin was uh, actually an uh, exchange with um, two years history, and uh, now it has over 5 million registered users from more than 100 countries. And now we offer different kind of projects, oh, sorry, different kind of products. For example, we have crypto to crypto spot trading, and we will launch our margin trading soon. And also we have field to crypto product as well. And we also have futures trading platform, which is our Kumex. And we also have two staking products. One is a soft staking, which allow you to trading and get the benefit from staking at the same time. And also we have another staking product, which we call it um, Pool X. And uh, it's just a get listed yesterday. 
yeah, that's the product line. And uh, currently, um, we are more focused on our security because nowadays a lot of like fraud hackers. So, and we are good at our technology because you know for some exchanges, right? They actually purchase a platform and do cloud exchange. But now for us, all the products are in-house built. Amazing. It is truly rare to have like three preeminent uh, exchanges on the same panel. Uh, and I think it's important to demystify what is a very murky process. And I know that each and every one of you touched on what your platform, your exchange does and does not. But let's just uh, summarize it a little bit in one or two sentences, if you may. What exactly on your exchange do you list or not list? And the reason why I'm saying this is that I know Andy uh, and Coinlist very well, and they do have a very particular particular lens. We have founders coming to us all the time and saying that, well, you guys are, you know, very friendly sister companies. Can we get an introduction to Coinlist for, for the process? And I know their process and therefore I don't want to waste their time, but how do you get that information out there? So can you please, each of you, why don't we start with you, Andy, on what do you guys work with and list and what you do not currently? Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's, there's two categories uh, to answer that question. One is on a very practical level, and from a compliance perspective, what do we list? On the Coinless Trade Exchange, which again is rolling out uh, shortly, we are listing cryptocurrencies, so non-securities, um, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And our focus in terms of deciding the second category of, of who we are listing within that, um, there's really two sets of things. One is these large cap cryptos. So we list Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDC. We'll continue to expand among the large cap crypto category. But then the second set for us is smaller, newer, up-and-coming tokens. And that's where Ken's getting at here, which is um, we've got a really stringent vetting process that we put projects through before we put them on the exchange. Um, we're not listing everything. We're not trying to cover every single asset pair out there. We want to be the place where you know you can go to find high-quality projects. Uh, and some of the things that we look at there are the team, the product, the market, the deal terms, the legal structure, the token economics. We've got a really long vetting process that we've honed over two years of running token sales and deciding which token sales to run. And we're applying that same set of criteria to, uh, to the, uh, the exchange listings. Um, and so you have to be really thoughtful about who you're putting on there because you know, for us, it's all about user trust. We have to make sure that our users know that we are a place for, for quality projects and, uh, and we can't uh, change that perception at all. How about you, Rita? Uh, okay, for me, uh, actually the objective of the listing team is finding the hidden gems in the crypto world. So what does it mean? Means we want to find the project with a good quantity to get to get listed in our platform, and then to go to success together. And uh, so nowadays we more focus on the quantity, the project with good quantity, and we have a very complex matrix to assess the project, and uh, from like user base, technology, product, and the application parts. And also for what we don't need currently, we don't need a security token because of license reason. Yeah, that's it. Sierra. Um, yeah, for us, uh, we don't we don't list uh, security token either. Um, and for the token, we are aiming to list. Um, of course, we're looking for the the best assets out there worldwide. Um, and we already listed around um, two hundred assets on our exchange. Um, two things that we really liked um, recently is uh, first of all real technology breakthrough that really helps with the industry growth, and secondly would be a working business model. Uh, we think that with a working business model, that's the true support that you can get um, to ensure that our, our users won't be heard on secondary market. And now that you guys have touched on the what, uh, can we uh, also talk about the where? And Huobi you know, has a extremely, probably about the most robust international uh, reach. Uh, you do have a US subsidiary as well. Can you clarify on how projects that are looking to be listed in more than one jurisdiction work with, within your organization and the different arms? Yes. So. Um, for Hobby US, we're still very early stage. We've been like um, uh, really conservative 
uh, but on uh, Hubi Global, we don't take any U.S. customers or Chinese customers. We do have an entity called Hubi China, but it's actually not an exchange. It does everything in the blockchain industry besides um, trading. So under Hubi China, we have um, the university that teach blockchain um, knowledge to traditional entrepreneurs, and then we have the Hubi research arm underneath it. Um, and then, uh, of course, for all of the users around the world, we have so many different entities around the world to take the customers. Uh, and Andy, uh, Coinlist is based just here in the U.S., as far as I know. Uh, what's your take on how does the platform deal with U.S. versus non-U.S. projects and investors? Absolutely. So uh, on the investor side, we're licensed in the U.S. right now in, in almost 40 states, and we're expanding that to, to cover the entire United States. Um, and so we're, we're focused there. We also do allow investors from many international jurisdictions, um, and we look at those on a case-by-case -case basis to make decisions, but we've attempted to get a really broad reach there, and we're certainly considering how we can better support those international investors uh, more natively, rather than from a U.S. exchange just allowing them on. Perhaps there's a way for us to launch international exchanges with a, a tighter focus on those user groups. Uh, Rita, you based out of Chengdu. <laughs> and uh, it's not this panel got to touch on that very positive comment that uh, President Xi Jinping uh, recently made about the industry, the technology overall. Can you share a little bit about the KuCoin's operational framework uh, in China and outside of China? Okay. Uh, actually, we are registered in Singapore and uh, we have our tech guys are based in China, Chengdu, but most of our teams Actually, a large portion of our teams are external of China. Yeah, we have teams in Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and Bulgaria. And uh, so for us, the main side, we have our global site, and we follow the jurisdiction of Singapore. And uh, currently, um, for the US project, we will examine carefully about their legal opinion. Actually, for every listed project, we do carefully examine the, the legal opinion, say whether it's security token, utility token, blah, blah. And uh, nowadays, we will, um, because now we only have one global site, and but in the future, we may develop some of the cloud exchange, and our legal team is working on to, um, trying to get license for the each um, domestic region, yeah. That's Amazing. Um, so I want to basically hone in a little bit more so that the audience can have like actual takeaways. Uh, so the next two set of questions, the first one is very quickly pricing, a uh, listing price, and time frame. Uh, if a project is actually successful, uh, why don't you go first, Rita? Okay. Price first. <laughs> okay, actually, um, let me, how about let me introduce the listing process first. Um, from KuCoin side, actually, we start from application form, and after that, we will go through our system rating, and then you will get an initial score, and if you pass the minimal threshold, then we will go through the manual quantity control. And for due diligence, actually, it's done in both of the two phase, and after that we will go through the negotiation part. It's purely depend on the quantity of the project. For example, if we think we have, if we think the project have potential and if we have a lot of user base, we may even don't change any of the listing fee because currently the listing fee is to cover the operating cost. That's that's the only thing we need it. And uh, after after the negotiation, we have a listing committee, and uh, we have a team of members, and we do voting on the project. Why we have this? Because we for um, for the committee, each person actually have different background. So for example, uh, some of the risks of the project I may not say, but my team member may say it. So that's why we have this group of committee, and we need to hands up like whether you vote yes or no. Yeah, that's a process. And after everything ready, we will prepare the contract and the signature, and then we get listed, and then we hold some campaign together, something like that. So to summarize, the fee is purely based on the quantity of the project. On average, though, say how much? On average, confidential. <laughs> yes, well, no one's going to tweet about this. I uh, actually, on average, it quite depends on the market because you know the BTC, the price is up and down. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Gotcha. How about you, Andy, uh, in Coinlist? Yeah, so for the Coinlist Trade Exchange, uh, 
again, I'll start with the process too. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Sit down with our team, have a conversation, have follow-up conversations we send over, uh, vetting questions, we go back and forth. And for us, again, we're really selective about who we work with. From our token sale business, we've run fewer than a dozen sales publicly over the last two years out of more than 3,500 inbound. So we're very selective about who we work with. We apply those same standards to the, uh, to the exchange. Um, and so it's just a matter of going back and forth on some of these questions, again, that I mentioned earlier around attributes of the project and the team and, and, uh, and our confidence in putting them on the exchange. Once we make a decision to put a project on the exchange, there is no listing fee. We do not charge fees for this. Um, our business is in running token sales and in running an exchange and not in charging fees to projects. Again, our goal is to attract the very best projects, and we do not want any friction for those projects to get on the exchange, so we do not, do not charge listing fees at all. And, and also, um, we don't charge the projects anything at all. So not only are there no listing fees, there's no co-marketing fees or anything else, we don't um, uh, charge anything to the project. All the fees we earn from the exchange are based on trading activity on the exchange itself. Um, so for Huobi, um, we're already six years old. Um, a lot of things has been changing and changed quite a bit uh, recently. So our application process starts with, of course, ap apply online, and then a lot of interviews with our BD team and uh, with me and with some of the other executives um, at Huobi Group. And um, we now the new system takes a lot of uh, outside opinions from world, world leading investors and also from the community. It's just uh, we don't make it public um, anymore for who we're working with with the due diligence um, process. Just want to make it more um, independent and uh, make it more fair to everyone. Um, and then for listing fee, we don't charge any listing fee now. Um, because um, there is really the strategy changing that will be group. And uh, according to President Xi, um, the, the country itself is uh, really endorsing blockchain industry. And that's at least how much we can do to help um, the industry growth. And we hope that um, all of the good projects can use um, the fees that they're supposed to pay to exchanges for um, technology development. Uh, Sierra, was that a, a surprising change uh, when you hear the President Xi's comment, or was that generally expected uh, within the crypto ecosystem uh, that China would be taking a friendlier approach toward blockchain technology, if not crypto specifically? Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a surprise um, because um, this is the first time ever our president ever endorsed any industry. In the history, so it's uh, quite a big surprise um, to to everyone in China. Um, however, on the other side, um, we kind of expect this because um, the Chinese government has been friendly with blockchain. For example, in a uh, Hainan um, province, um, the government has been really friendly with blockchain, and uh, uh, Huobi Group is actually hosting the first ever government-backed um, blockchain conference um, in December 15th in, in Hainan uh, with the government, and we are inviting a lot of government officials from um, different countries as well. Um, and also in Shenzhen, we have the um, blockchain sandbox, so it's kind of expected, but still, it's a, it's a surprise. It's group. highly encouraging. Uh, President Trump uh, had less kind things to say about <laughs> cryptocurrency a few months back. But going back to the topic at hand, uh, my second round of questions is that if each of you can just give two do's and two don'ts for a project founder that are you know, hoping to maximize their chance of sitting down with you guys for an interview, you forget about the, the actual outcome and success, just two, two do's and two don'ts. Why don't we start with you, Ciara? Um, well, when they, you mean like when they do the interview with us? Oh no, for, for the project, that in that process, you know, if they, yeah, like whatever, the, from talking economics to, to the process itself, like what are two things that are very positive that you guys would, you know, would be uh, looking at it favorably yeah. and two things that would be like a no? Yeah, so that, that would be the two things that just shared. Um. The, in the questions uh, before. So the first is technology breakthrough, and then the second is the working business model. And for don'ts, um, well, there's one thing I really want to m mention in the application process. Don't try to find anyone um, for maximizing your opportunity to be listed on Hobby. 
and pay extra fee because I, I know that there are a lot of third parties out there trying to take that mid middle fee and to, to help projects get listed on Huobi. It will not help you. Uh, on the other side, it will really hurt you because then like that project will be moving to the, well, to the like blacklist. Yeah. Uh, is there anything specifically or a scenario whereby on paper uh, everything looks really good and upon an interview that you're like, no, as, as it turned out, it didn't work out that way. Like, it, can you give an example? Uh, a, lo a lot. <laughs> Our, uh, a and what went right? wrong then, generally? Um, scams. We see too, too many scams. Let's say in the industry, it's been improving, especially when the Bitcoin, pri uh, Bitcoin price dropped to like three thousand dollars. Really washed out a lot of the um, unqualified people um, out from this industry. Um, um, yeah, so that would be. Yeah. Uh, Andy. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think uh, on the do side, um, one is make your token economic model really obvious and put that up front. A lot of teams, and this maybe gets to the, the second question you were just asking, a lot of teams come to us with a great team, interesting product, big market they're attacking, but the token economics just don't make sense. It's a big stumbling block for people, so put that up front, make it really obvious how the economic model works for the token. That's a big do. Another do, which isn't necessary but certainly helps, is get introduced to us by someone that already knows us and has a relationship. We will look at every project that comes our way and consider them seriously, but if someone that we trust sends a project to us and says, you should really look at this, um, we take that recommendation seriously. And so if you can find a way to get introduced to us warmly, that's a good thing. Uh, on the don't side, um, one is uh, don't, uh, please don't do anything illegal prior to coming to us and, and trying to work with us. Um, makes it really hard. And, uh, and so we, uh, you know, just be really thoughtful from the very beginning. It's not just about your status at the time that you're coming to us, but everything you've done in the past matters too. And it's important as you're getting started to, to not forget that. Um, and another don't that uh, comes up shockingly more often than you would think, don't try and bribe someone on the coinless team. <laughs> uh, we have people come to us and you know, say to someone on the coinless team, hey, you know, there's something in this for you if you work with us. We don't do that. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a, a real disqualifier. So um, we have a high integrity process. We want the projects we're working with to do the same uh, and just uh, take it step by step, follow the process. And, uh, and if it's a worthwhile partnership, it'll get through. Yeah. Um, OK, I agree with Andy on the token metrics side because we also um, we have a scorecard. And for this part, it's with a big portion, <laughs> just add on, and also the bribery. Um, so for me, the two do's, uh, I, will, I will mention the process side. So first thing, fill in as much as information you can, because for our assessments, it's purely, it will be the initial assessment is based on what you provide us. And also please have the document we need in front when you submit your application. Firstly is a um, code audit report, because we look at your code, we look at your um, technology, whether it's secure, something like that. And the second thing is the legal opinion, because we will check whether it's utility token, blah, blah, and under which jurisdictions. And also the company certificate, as well as the long disclosure agreement. Yeah, that's a document you need to be prepared. So here are the to do's. And for the don'ts, first thing is don't trust any people approach you from an not from not not from the official channels. For example, we say a lot of scammers claim from the Telegram say you can get Nestle on KuCoin, something like that. And the second don't is please don't lie to us. Yeah. And also just now you ask Sarah that's um a situation that you decline the project. For us, I can give you example. Because we need to do KYC in the process with the top COOs, like COO, CTO, CEO. Why we, we do KYC, not only the KYC part, but we also ask questions like, what's the CEO have in mind, like the potential of your project? We need to examine on the CEO's mindset, because it's 
really important that the CEO know what he's doing and what his token is for and what his roadmap and how it will be the future for the project. So once we decline a project because the COO doesn't know much about the project, something like that. Yeah. Uh, incredibly helpful. And uh, I perhaps I missed it, but did you guys uh, address typically how long the process would take to get a rejection or a green light to move forward, uh, Rita? Okay, so for the initial part, because it's a, a system generated rating, so it's like a stack queue, first in, first out. So this part takes about one week to two weeks, and, uh, and the whole process is about one month to two months. That's why I would um, encourage you to have the information ready, because how active your response will um, decide that how long the phase lasts. Yeah, similarly, uh, a month, two months, but um, if it's going to be a no, we try and tell you as soon as possible instead of dragging the process out. Um, but the, the successful ones will tend to take a month or two months. Um, yeah, with the new system, we, we try to improve the efficiency um, because of uh, all the complaints from projects that um, they, they don't get uh, an answer um, sooner enough. Um, so before, it takes about like two to three months, that will be, and now uh, it takes generally around a month. Uh, but for mainnet pro um, projects, because the integration takes longer, so it would be like around 45 days. Amazing, it's actually shorter than I had expected. Um, you know, yours are obviously the three uh, premier brands among the exchanges, but there are new ones popping up every day uh, in almost in every region. Um, how do you guys, or how should one, value or evaluate exchanges? And why don't we start with you, Sierra? And I would love to know, based on that definition, how do you measure up at Huabi? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we've seen a lot of um, articles, researches, um, saying that um, this is the ranking for exchanges worldwide. Um, and a lot of them look at um, trading volumes. Um, but um, I'd say it's really hard to measure whether the data are, 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 are true or not. Because, you know, uh, for high, high frequency trading, if you give zero fee account, it's basically you can do unlimited trading volumes. So it really shouldn't be, shouldn't be the right way to measure an exchange. Um, I think the only two fair ways to measure an exchange, um, the first one would be its revenue. Um, that's the thing that you can't lie about. So for Huobi, um, everything's transparent because we use 20% of our revenue to buy back our platform token. Um, we just did our buyback and, um, and burned uh, for quarter three um, um, about two weeks ago. And um, I believe um, in that um, aspect, we are worldwidely ranked number one. Um, our revenue is about uh, two times of finance, and uh, that really shows uh, when we're doing the repurchase and um, for our platform tokens. And um, also, um, secondly, I think, is the assets um, that's being stored on your exchanges, because um, especially when you look at BTC and USDT, because um, Exchanges are different from wallets. Whatever asset users are putting into the exchange would be the assets they use to trade. Um, so I think that's um, that's a fair way to measure what exchanges are, are bigger and what are not. Uh, Rita, do you uh, agree? Partially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for the trading volume wise, I think, yeah, it's problematic because ranking purely on that is actually not quite fair because nowadays, you know, you do watch trading, the cost to pump up the volume is, the cost is really no. So, um, well, for us, we will um, evaluate like uh, exchange whether it's good um, based on a few perspective. For example, the team, whether they are doing uh, real things. And for them, we also look at the technology and the most of the thing we value for a crypto exchange is the security. Yeah, and also we also look at the product, whether it's user friendly and uh, for example, like the API. Nowadays we have um, version two API, which is more stable and provide different other types like 
yeah, different order types. And also we will look at the customer service. So for example, once I think I try on Binance, I contact the customer service, then I have to wait two days to get a response. But if you come to um, KuCoin, you can try now. We have online service which will respond to you instantly. Yeah, that's how we look at the evaluation for our exchange. Yeah, value-wise, the revenue and the things, yes, it's important for exchange. But for us, because we are customer-oriented, so um, what we think important is to provide the customer the most efficient and secure way to trading crypto. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Andy, here in the U.S., uh, how do you look at Coinbase? How do you guys measure up or uh, similar to exchanges here in the U.S.? Yeah, I think when you're looking at exchanges, there's two binary filters you need to put an exchange through. One, do they have a track record of keeping funds safe? This goes to the security point Rita made. It's the most important thing. If an exchange has lost user funds, you have to know that that is an existential risk for that exchange, and that's a, a serious concern. And the second is compliance. That's also an existential risk for an exchange. If an exchange is non-compliant, it risks just being shut down. And so all the other metrics about an exchange don't matter if one of those two things uh, is true and, and you either have uh, loss of funds or, or uh, lack of compliance. But beyond that, I'd agree with, with what Sierra and Rita both said around, uh, around the product, around the technology, around the customer support, around revenue. Um, these are all criteria, and depending on what perspective you're looking at an exchange from, as a user, as a, as a project, uh, as an investor in the exchange, uh, you're going to look at those factors differently and weight them um, differently. You know, I think in terms of the, the US market, to your question, Ken, uh, a really big factor there is the assets that are listed. Because particularly on US exchanges, there are often very few assets listed on the exchange, which uh, may be good for that exchange. They may be able to drive significant revenue and have a successful business on the back of just a couple assets. But for users, if you're looking at it from a user perspective, they often want more than that. And so looking at exchanges that are able to offer more assets, a wider array of things to trade to make the users happy, I think is a really good way to, to measure the different US exchanges against each other. Awesome. We can talk about this for hours, but I want to switch over to uh, fund venture investing uh, real quick, given that we have less than seven minutes left. Um, Sierra and Rita, do you guys have equal system funds? KuCoin uh, have. How about you, Sierra? We do. Uh, can you very quickly describe the investment strategy for your ecosystem fund uh, and specifically just the lens, the due diligence uh, differ from that that you apply for listing? Um, so um, starting from uh, this year, I'd say from March, uh, we started only investing um, projects that we have strategic partnership with. So we help with building the ecosystem for Hobi. Um, and uh, due diligence, uh, we apply the same standards as listing. So it's very, very uh, strict. Okay, for KuCoin, actually for us, the investment, the key is the diversity. So we will look into different fields. For example, we will look at the um, public chain and we look at wallet, DEX, something like that. And what we most value is how the project will benefit the KuCoin ecosystem, how it fit to us, and how can we create a synergy and we benefit, how can we benefit each other. And uh, then for the, um, what? Yeah, no, just the, uh, how large is the ecosystem fund at KuCoin currently? Um, it's case by case, yeah, very by projects. Is there a focus on US, non-US, uh, or completely agnostic geographically? Uh, no. Not agnostic? Yeah. Uh, Sierra. Um, Andy, you're like one of the most prolific uh, fundraiser in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, Coinless is raised from Polychain, from Collaborative Fund, and very recently announced yesterday, Jack Dorsey of Twitter uh, makes his first investment into the space. And uh, can you just highlight now some do's and some don'ts uh, that you have seen or yourself have made in terms of mistakes or like right things to do in navigating what is a lengthy and tricky process? Yeah, uh, first of all, I would say uh, after this panel, I recognize Ken's moderating right now, but you should find him and ask him the same question. You guys have run uh, how many offerings now for projects in your platform? Well, 140 plus. Yeah, 140 yeah. offerings. So a lot, of, a lot of projects have gone through both accredited and non-accredited. Um, and so uh, I'm sure, Ken, you yourself have some great tips. But um, do's and don'ts, 
Uh, I actually think it's very similar to what I was saying about how to get listed on the Coinless Trade Exchange. Find the right way into an investor. Figure out how you can get in touch with them in the best way. Figure out how you can angle your pitch towards them in the best way. What do they care about? Some investors care about scale at all costs and growth. Some investors care much more about the business model, about the profitability. Figure out what it is that they want. And first of all, decide if they're even a good fit for you. I think a lot of people go and fundraise from investors blindly and just say, this person's supposed to be a great investor. I want to talk to them. Sometimes there's a fundamental misalignment. And you're building a business that's focused on profitability. And they're building a, a fund that is wholly focused on scale at all costs. And so you have to figure out if you're, you're going to the right investors. And then make the pitch to them. Make the pitch based on what you're doing, being aligned with what they want. And that's all you need to do. At the end of the day, every investor has a different process. Every company is at a different stage uh, and has different things to pitch. But if you can align yourself with the investor, if you are genuinely aligned with them, and you can make that clear to them, that's the best, best path for an investment in general. And then the, the process itself is case by case for each investor, how much they need, what sorts of interactions they want, and how you can actually get the deal done. Um, and I only have uh, two things to add to that, which is, you know, when you send out an email, someone an email, you don't hear back. It may very well be that the person is like super busy. Don't hesitate to send a follow-up email or two, but do take no for an answer and don't take it personally. Uh, if you're going to be out there in fundraising, you are going to hear, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 no's before a yes. A no, it's just a no. It's not a big deal. Move on. Um, last question. We have three minutes left. Uh, the industry has changed a lot in the past two years, particularly in the last 12 months. It used to be that crypto is about ignoring VC, go straight to ICOs and then IEO, et cetera. Now you see a trend of projects getting validation from VCs before going to an exchange to get listed. What's each of your take on VC-backed first and then listing or completely indifferent? Why don't you go first, Rita? Um, I think it depends on the roadmap of the project. Yeah, because in the initial stage, the project may need funds and to build the team up and to make the to make their product more stable, something like that. So they may go to VC first. But for the next team part, um, depends on the um, depends on the project actually, because if the project is self-funded and if he want to have secondary market, want to more user know this project, it, it can come for NIST as well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd agree with that. It's, it's absolutely case by case, project to project. The one thing I would say though, is a lot of people think that the VC funded path is the only path forward. Um, but if you look at it, the most, by a long shot, the most successful asset in our space is Bitcoin, and Bitcoin did not raise any money. And so uh, I'd encourage people to think about, at least consider the option of the non-VC-backed path, decide if that's possible for your team and what you're working towards, and, uh, and maybe even take that step. Uh, yeah, I agree with, with that. Uh, it really depends on the project and your, um, your plans and your um, anticipate milestones. Amazing. I hope uh, you guys have learned as much as I have. Uh, if you can, give our distinguished panelists a round of applause. And, and if you would, uh, stick around for a little bit so that you can, uh, you know, people can take questions. Thank you so much.